Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Nick, and welcome back to another episode of Integrative U Radio. Today, we are blessed with the beautiful marketing genius that we have behind the scenes at Integrative U. Her name is Kayla, and I am excited for the questions that she is going to be interviewing me with today. Thank you, Dr. Nick. I interviewed Dr. Nicole, and I lured some really great information from her. And so the intention for this interview was to do the very same thing. However, I'm going to throw a curveball at you. I'm wondering if you don't mind. Every single meeting that we have on a weekly basis, at the very end of the meeting, we all have the opportunity to ask Dr. Nick, one word. <laughs> he has to answer with one minute. And it blows our mind every single week how you do this. So I was wondering if we could have this interview be one word, one, one, word, one minute. minute. Yeah. I mean, if you're not slightly uncomfortable, you're not growing and you just <laughs> made me slightly uncomfortable. So that's right. Yeah. I knew you would be okay with this, but I know you are not prepared. So I you buckle never, up. You're never prepared for one word, one minute. <laughs> no. Um, so for the listeners, A, we also have this on YouTube if you want to watch the video aspect of it. But before we get started with that, a little background story on the one word, one minute is that I actually stole this concept from one of the best leaders in the entire world, John Maxwell. And John Maxwell has developed leaders that develop other leaders in literally over a hundred countries. And one of the things that he does with his team high level is I think his, cause he's on another notch. He's been doing it for a couple of years. I, I think he does it in one word in 30 seconds. So I was like, well, let's just give me a little bit of leeway. I'll do one word in, in one minute, but I found it for the, for the leaders leading teams, I found it in, it extremely beneficial, as I just stated, it, it makes you uncomfortable and it makes you re like you have to remove all of your attachments to what's coming and just allow information to come into you because you have to tap in to that, like greater awareness to be able to get the information that you need in such a short amount of time without prepping for it. So that's just a little preframing for the leaders that are running teams, you know, even moms and dads the, running the families when you know kids come up and we're bombarded it's like being able to practice this just allows you to be that much more aware and present all right let's do it i love it one word one minute okay here we go all right my first mm -hmm. word is dr nick in other words who are you Dr. Nick, that's not what I was expecting to be the first word. And it's actually two words. So I cheated. <laughs> Dr. Nick is based around the energy of connection and connection is my highest value. And what I have found throughout the years is that I've always served people in a plethora of ways, whether it be physical work through personal training, how I started and through neurological work as a doctor, biochemical as a functional medicine, medicine practitioner, energy work, now doing a lot of the mental behavior stuff that I was always bringing imbalances back into a connection because we're all just energy and that energy is power. And when we don't have access to that power, our quality of life decreases. So what I do is help through my highest value people increase their connection so they can increase their power, which increases the quality of their life. Amazing. I, I do want to preface this. I, you know, knowing, knowing you personally and, and watching how you've grown as a practitioner is, it, it's been such a joy working with you guys in this way. I, I I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows Dr. Nick has transformed from chiropractor, integrative medicine doctor. You could call him a, a polymath. He is a well-researched practitioner in so many areas. And where you have 
landed is this complementary facilitation of psychoenergy that is the work that you do in 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 complement with integrative medicine at integrative view so my next question is or word rather is psychoenergetic healing sorry i cheated again <laughs> psychoenergetic healing when you think about it, psycho is the aspect of the mind energy is interesting because energy is really only a concept through Newtonian physics. When you get into the world of quantum physics, they state that there is no energy, that everything is just information, that we label things as energy to allow us to understand. But when you think of energy, energy is a charge. It's a polarization. So that charge is either positive or negative. It was Einstein that taught us that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So when you look at the psycho aspect of healing, is that we all start out in a state of balance, that creation, because creation is in a state of balance. Everything's in a state of balance except the mind. Perception is usually what creates our duality outside of balance. And with that understanding is that too much or too little is what breaks that connection. It's what creates every single symptom that we have. Those symptoms, if large enough, will label as disease. But diseases and symptoms are just one of the same thing, a higher polarity of one or the other. And it's a feedback mechanism to see that the psycho, that the mind is not in a state of balance, is not in a state of equanimity. So when we look at the psycho aspect of healing, we go back and get into the specific moment in time because space is what actually creates the quality of our time and to balance out the mind in that space. And when we do, the body automatically changes because the charge, the polarization, the energy gets back into a state of balance. Amazing. Can you Makes share, sense, right? can you share how you use psychoenergetic testing and facilitate healing using this technique? How, how do you do that with your clients? We do this in a combination of ways, actually. This, I mean, this is a question. It's not one word, one minute, but this I know I'm going to sprinkle. <laughs> I got to give myself some leeway here because that, that wasn't one minute. <laughs> so the, the psychoenergetic testing that I do is interesting because it has been evolution. Honestly, the, I first started learning, I guess in a way chiropractic is a form of energy work because when you start in school, you're, you're in palpation class and they're teaching you how to feel joints in the spine underneath the skin and you touch somebody and you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Like, I don't feel anything. No. This is, I, I'm not going to be a, a good chiropractor. And then you practice. And one of our teachers gave us actually a, a challenge to get like a piece of thread and then eventually like a piece of hair or something, but put it under a page of paper and like feel it and then see how many pages you could actually still feel the hair underneath the paper. Cool. And what I started to realize is that I couldn't physically feel the strand of hair, but I could feel the energy of where the hair was because I got through so many pages and that like blew my mind. And I didn't get into energy work then. It was just, I was kind of like, I can feel this hair without feeling the hair. Right. And that translated to be able to feel, you know, organs systems within the body. It feel like, you know, different deeper layers, layers of the spine. But, when I was in practice in chiropractic, we had a client that actually was a very powerful energy practitioner. She went to the Barbara Brennan school and did a lot of other things. And she saw something inside of me and actually just kind of like started teaching me some energy work, some easy two pointing to be able to two pointing is easy way to think of like that duality. If there's a positive charge, it's connected to an equal opposite negative charge that they're counterbalancing each other. In order to create homeostasis energetically, we want to connect those two points. So that's like how she started teaching me energy work is just to be able to find something within the body that had a reduced charge or something that had a higher charge and then looked for its counterpart part. So she started teaching me two point, which I didn't realize then, which is the foundation of literally the Demartini method that I use a lot in the human behavior, part of the more of the mental aspect of the psychoenergetic is the same thing is to balance out the mind. We have to look at something that's, you know, greater than connect that to what's less than. So with all of this process, the testing portion, 
we we run so many different tests. You know, you could even say that like the regular blood panel is a is a type of that because it's looking at energy just in a different way. But trying to keep this short, but we had ran a whole big blood panel, and it actually got ran twice through the company, and which is just interesting. But the the results came back completely different. Same blood yeah. ran twice. And one of the panels, Lime was pretty much completely all the bands positive. And the other one only had like two bands. So it was there was some active, but not a positive panel. Same blood, literally just moments ran apart, completely different information. And I was like, well, this is interesting. This is supposed to be the gold standard, but we need to have understand that nothing's perfect. Let's just actually start getting more data. And during chiropractic school, I did applied kinesiology and that's like muscle testing, brim hall technique, which is another form of muscle testing and all these different form of techniques with different forms of muscle testing. And that was awesome. But one of the teachers was like, don't do it for biochemistry. It's great for emotions. It's great for nervous system. But when it comes to biochemistry, just do, do labs and realized that that was a half truth. It just, it was testing biochemical in a different way. So it's this, the same information, but looking at it through a different perspective, which is going to give you different information. Right. So we started doing muscle testing and this is the crazy part, which blows people's minds is that muscle testing, when you look at it, it is just a response from the nervous system. So when the nervous system is not stressed or not having a reaction to something, it stays in its similar state. So if you test a weak muscle, it's going to stay weak. If you test a strong muscle, it's going to test strong. Usually muscle practitioners are starting with a strong muscle. So then looking for it to go weak or weak to go strong. You're looking for that change. So going through and testing realize that you don't have to test the person directly because I, we had a lot of families coming in and testing babies and children. And it's just like, you know, testing like their arm, you know, it's, they don't understand what you're trying to do. So the muscle test is just kind of like difficult to understand and perceive anyways. So understanding the flow of energy, it's the two endpoints of energy. So you can actually connect. And I bought these, I think they're called space balls on Amazon to be able to show this to the kids and to the family so they'd understand it. But it's like this ping pong ball with two electrodes, two little metal pieces on the outside. And just through the electricity, the current running through your skin, when you touch both of those, the light bulb in the middle of this ping pong ball will light up. So wow. I could, I could hold this ping pong ball and touch one side with my left hand, not touch the right side. And, but when I put my right hand on it, it would light up. And that was pretty cool because people, my kids don't, would love that. people don't understand that we're electricity. We're just energy. Right. And then I'd have the kid touch one side and it wouldn't light up, but then I'd touch the kid, which would complete the cycle, the circle, the circuit and the ball would light up. And then I'm like, well, let's have your mom touch this and let's you touch your mom and then hold my hand. And there would just be a bigger circuit and the ball would light up. I go, so all that matters is that the two endpoints are connected. So mm -hmm. I could muscle test the mom or the dad while they're holding on to the child. And it's the information of the child, the endpoint that would be actually being received as well as my energy. That's the hard part with muscle testing is you all, you always have to know your shit so that you're not thinking that you're testing somebody else. So this was pretty cool, but then we started seeing clients all over the nation and all over the world. And one of the amazing things is that I'd created this different flow of how to test more complete with muscle testing. And I found instead of just like, most people focus just on the biochemical or most just on the neurological. And I broke it down testing every single different energetic layer. So coming back to that cycle of this woman who studied under Barbara Brennan, Barbara Brennan breaks the body down to all these different energy systems. And so I started testing all those different energy systems and then breaking the, each of one of those energy systems down even further, not to get into the nitty gritty. So it's yeah. just like this really in-depth testing process. And I'm like, the, all these people are missing out on this. And so I went to Dr. Klinghart, who's a brilliant genius in that world muscle testing. 
and he found he created a synthetic quartz crystalline like testing plate because quartz is a magnifier and the reason he created a synthetic one that there's no impurities so we're not getting the feedback from impurities so these synthetic where he was teaching so it's more accurate because if you put let's say you know a supplement on there that energy is going out into your entire energetic field acting as if you already consumed it that it's in your field which is just genius to think about what i figured out as well as some other practitioners is that you could put on a separate plate dna so you could put hair you could put fingernails you could put blood you could put saliva and if you put enough different cells that had the full amount of dna of the human body it would be as if you were challenging kind of like holding that little child you had the other person all their dna on that testing plate which is kind of crazy to think about yeah so to be able to test distantly we had we used hair in the office we had people send in hair samples and we used hair through the dna through a lot of different we did bioresonance we did different bio scans and then i used it also for this muscle testing so we'd be able to out having like an it's called like an intermediate just as if you were having like the mom touch the child i was still muscle testing somebody's arm that their hand was then just on the testing plate that their somebody else's dna or hair was underneath and it sounded fucking crazy to me too at the time but what i would do is i would do that with that same process with clients in the office so i would have a regular visit with clients in the office and then for i think 2 to 3 months until i was like for sure that the results were very similar the results are never the same cuz we change moment to moment and the only constants change so nothing's exactly the same but yeah so i did that for 2 to 3 months doing tests twice on people in person yeah. as well as through the hair to make sure i wasn't just fucking crazy and that this theory worked and it actually i think i found that it was better you got better results with the person and not being like consciously focusing on testing and on anything just allowing their true nature state whatever they were doing throughout the day so did that and then it was probably like a year later i was like well i really being a business owner I'm like I really don't want to pay somebody to be this intermediate. I'm like how can I just test like the hair by itself? How can I just like test without having so I could just do it myself? And pretty much what I came up to, I was really deep in studying quantum physics at the time and one of the energetic techniques that I had trained in was holographic energy healing. And I was like one day I was like fucking light bulb and I was like I can muscle test through a hologram and did the same process again so I'm testing you know distance the hair the intermediate doing that like a week later I test the same person but I just create a hologram and like the simple way to think about it is cuz I'd never seen these people the way we set up our testing so I I didn't have a visual of like creating who they were but I had their name and their birth date and that's specific to that individual. So I would just create like a ball of energy because when you take energy back down to its simplest form it's a sphere. So I didn't really create a a hologram of the person. I had a sphere of energy which was the hologram of which contained all the energy of that individual connected to their name and their birth date. So not to confuse people like that doesn't make sense. Well, I'm that was the left brain with the right brain fighting each other. So I started doing that 3 months like holy shit this is fucking working like awesome. And then I was like the, the weird thing with the hologram and the deeper I got with quantum physics is that the the more you try to attach to something the less you're you're actually attached to it which really gets us the deeper understanding of the law of attraction. The law of attraction is as soon as you as soon as you stop wanting something and you just have it it comes into your life but any time that we want something we're actually creating space with it space between like that's the distance the wanting is the the concept of lack of so if i'm wanting to attach to this information the hologram 
I was actually creating space between that field of information and myself. And when I really owned that and learned that, I was like, well, no more hologram testing. So then I, same thing, would do the hologram testing because I was good at it and got good results. But then I would just look at the person's name and date and I would just connect with them and not connect to anything. I was just like intention testing. Like this is what the results I'm going to get from. And that's the, that psycho energetic is that the mind is above the body. And there's a lot of scientific studies behind this to prove this is that the, anytime that there's a thought, there is the, some weird quantum entanglement. Some people call it string theory. Some people call it some other things, but there's a connection with that information. And this has been proved like way back when, like there's a, a book, one of my favorite books, the, the life of plants. It was written in the seventies by a scientist. And he proved that plants also have emotions and memories, but instantaneously, the scientist was halfway around the world giving a lecture and he set up some specific timelines and dated it in his journal that he would speak to this plant. And this plant was set up actually on a, a lie detector. That was like some of the best technology they had had back then to be able to evaluate changes in electrical activity. And every time that he would set intention and emotionally connect with this plant and speak to it, there'd be activity going off on the charts. And it was just crazy. So it shows that everything is in this world is completely connected. It's just that we have to kind of forget all the bullshit that we've been taught because it's not really true. All of that uses our lower mind. Our lower mind, honestly, is only here to allow us to perceive reality. Anytime that we're using our lower mind to guide us to make decisions, quote unquote, like the how, the doing, it's not what it's designed for. So it gets in our way and it sets us back and it creates more symptoms, more resistance, more problems. So pretty much like the muscle testing, that whole process taught me in a weird, very long way, which I now teach clients a lot more efficient way to do it, to stop using their lower mind and tap into their higher mind to increase that connection, to be able to gather the information that's always been there to better serve themselves. That was a lot more than one, one, one minute, but that's no, that, no, I, I, I broke the rule. I, I asked you a question. <laughs> so that was a, that was a wonderful answer to it. I, I am just in awe. And I have some follow-up questions, you know, one of them being, if you don't mind, I, I, will, I will get back to the one word, but now I just can't help myself. You and, and Dr. Nicole, you started an integrative medicine practice, and now you've incorporated psychoenergetic facilitation and, and this process into your integrative medicine practice. And your focus is on up-leveling the human experience for influential leaders. And I'm curious as to, you know, perhaps you, you could answer this however you'd like. Maybe you want to, you could give me a story of, of how the two complement each other, but why did you, why did you bring these two integrative medicine and psychoenergetic healing work into this practice to help influential leaders? Yeah. I mean, foundationally it's, I mean, from it's, for me, it's probably slightly different than Nicole, the, the why behind it. I'm definitely more of a, the woo woo, <laughs> like big picture loving. I'm very sure, but you're so grounded and very sense, yeah, very sensitive. Yeah. I, I mean, I was, they didn't have that defined back then, but as a child, I was definitely a highly sensitive person, um, yeah. not knowing what that is. And it's not a label. It's just like, that's just how my body receives information. It's not yeah. a bad thing. It's not a good thing. It's just, you know, a fucking sensitive person. Right. <laughs> but one of the things that I'm always trying to do is to increase, I guess the easiest way like is to increase love but not the love that most people think and think love is like, Oh, you make me feel good. The, the, I love you, the physical love, the deeper universal love, that state of equanimity, that state of actually balance. Because when you look at evolution and this is the, the other side of the brain, every single life cycles 
all we're trying to do is evolve. You know, you look at every single family, the parents, all they're trying to do is leave a better life for their kids every single time. Even if the parents are making some fucking shitty decision, like mm, they're doing the best that they can in every single moment. And everybody does like mm -hmm. the, that's the aspect of the mind is that there's no mistakes because we make the best decision in that moment. It's just afterwards we look back and like, ah, oh, I, sh I should have made a different, different action, different decision, all this stuff. But that's, it's all bullshit. And we'll talk about that later. So, the we're microcosms of a macrocosm. We literally are a mini universe living in a macro bigger universe. You know, when you think about our body, our body is a universe and we have, you know, our chakras are actually connected to different planetary systems, but you can think of like our organ systems of different countries within this world. So we have so many different things and, you know, we're in control of all these different cells trillions of atoms, like all these things. And they're just part of what our consciousness, our consciousness, the quality of it is dictating the quality of their experience, their life. Same thing with us. We have a larger consciousness above us that we're a part of, but it's understanding energy is bi-directional. So we can actually help the bigger aspect of this life cycle that we're a part of by decreasing entropy and increasing order. And that for me is my foundationally bigger picture is to help thought leaders or very influential people to up level themselves because they're the individuals that are going to make the biggest effects in the world to increase order and decrease entropy. And by doing that, we can quote unquote, better the cycle of the consciousness above us. Great generational change. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> So just your typical response, right? <laughs> I'm, I have another one. I don't word. have many friends. <laughs> My word now this works perfectly is, and again, this is two words, but generational change. Generational change occurs um, bi-directional. So one, I always say we have to take our foot off the brakes and allow us to move forward, but we also need to put our foot on the gas to propel us forward. So I always found it more efficiently to start by taking our foot off the brake. So that goes back and removing the transgenerational trauma or stresses that's put on us. Science has proved that up to eight generations before us is what's affecting the, you can call it splicing or representation of our DNA. Because when you think about it, you're just half of your mom and dad's DNA and they're half of their mom and dad's DNA. And what happens is that these stresses get collected in the information of our DNA. Yeah. Like most of what we've been taught about our DNA is bullshit and it's not how it works. Our DNA is just a printer. That's literally all it is. It, it takes in information and it puts information out. So that's what a printer does. Printer receives information from the computer. It takes it and it prints it out. Our DNA is just a bunch of little printers that's giving the information to build amino acids, proteins, that's the building blocks of all of our cells, tissues, and organs. So when we understand that, it's the quality of the information that we're sending those printers because that's the building blocks, that's the blueprint that's building ourselves. So we need to change the information coming in from our past to actually change the script for that printer, that DNA to make. I think when we get better technology, instead of eight generations, we'll probably go back to about 12, maybe 13 generations back. That I use a bunch of different techniques. One of them is, one of my favorites is using meditation with, it's called a like quantum jumping, which is just going back into time specific moments. But when you shut the conscious mind down, the subconscious as well as aspects of the unconscious come more online. So we allow ourselves, our mind to go back into time because time is just a represent, representation of space. So we literally have the power to time travel, which is pretty cool. And that's, I mean, there's tons of CIA documents on remote viewing and all of that. If you're interested in reading that, the other aspect of that. So you have to go back in the time to balance out those moments because any imbalance with a large enough polarity is what creates a change or a splice within the DNA that change changes its 
signaling. It's, um, what do you want to call it? Manifestation of what it's creating right. on the other side, we want to get clarity of what we want to bring in. So we want to neutralize the past and then we want to bring in the future into that printer. So this is about getting crystal clear of what's most important to you, your highest values, what your purpose is, purposes, your mission, your purpose and mission is like your purpose is the me and the mission is the we. And understanding that life is all about balance. You want to equally serve yourself as well as humanity. So your purpose and mission need to be in alignment, need to be in that state of equity as well. And then in that, in that work, you are able to just with one person, you can create generational change in, in your DNA. Yeah. Cause when you think about it, when you change that, and this is like hard for people to maybe grasp the first time they hear it, you're healing 12 generations back, but you're also healing 12 generations ahead of you. Shit. Yeah. Right. And when you get deeper into this matrix or simulation that we're living in is that there, there is no time. Like that's the perception of our past and our futures kind of bullshit, honestly, because our higher self has lived how many lifetimes? Like, I mean, we don't know. Cause we've kind of, we have to forget in order to go through this process of rising up, but the higher mind, cause everything's just consciousness and the higher mind, the higher consciousness, it doesn't care about life. Like in this physical body, like I can go, if I don't learn what I'm supposed to learn this lifetime, it's like, well, do it again. It's a video game. Yeah. Like when you think about right. it, it's like, well, play the game again until you learn how to go up to the next level. Like oh, it boy. doesn't care how many times. Done. It doesn't care how many times you play the video game to learn the lessons, to get back into that state of love. Like it just, it just is up there. It's, it's our, and that's the lower mind that thinks that everything's such a fucking big deal. And it's like, we, that's the aspect of surrendering. That's so hard. It's like, no, like, like Buddha said, like all of our sufferings connect to our attachments that how something's supposed to be. And it's like, no, it's that that's the doing and the having the, the goal is your connection with your being. And once you bring your being to that state of equanimity, that state of balance, then you're in that state of unconditional love. And then you received the lesson, the learning. Now you jump up to that new level, new level, new devil. That's really funny that you mentioned the word surrender, because that was my next word. Surrendering. It's, it's a bitch. <laughs> Surrendering is not easy. Because we surrendering is not easy because of our programming of our nervous system. Our animalistic mind is designed first to protect ourselves and surrendering doesn't feel like a safe form of protection. So that is always going to keep us back. That's why it's, you know, called a reptilian mind. It's, it feeds off of fear and it wants like it wants to live. It's its own living entity. And that's the aspect of, you know, their old animalistic reptilian mind is that it wants what's going to feed it. It wants the fear. It wants the, the grief. It wants the loss. It wants, you know, anxiety, depression. It wants all these really strong polarized feelings. As soon as we get out of that and go into the prefrontal cortex, the executive center of the mind, and it's called the executive center for a reason, just like a business, we want executives right. to be asking highly quality questions to be able to get highly quality answers that we can actually take action from. And so when we can transfer that energy into the prefrontal cortex, that's when we can actually start the surrendering process. It doesn't occur there. Surrendering occurs when we help balance the mind out through asking those quality questions that disempowers the hindbrain, the reptilian mind that balances the brain activity. When the brain is actually in a state of balance, the heart opens. And when the brain is in a deep enough state of equanimity, the heart opens. What happens with the heart is that the ele electrical activity of the brain drops down into a alpha theta state, which is like a meditative state. And then it shoots up into a high gamma state which is what we found scientifically is the frequency of love. Wow. So when we surrendering is a part 
of experiencing unconditional love. That was that was a perfect one word. I loved that one. I I was excited. <clears throat> I almost used that in our meeting last week, but I thought I would save it for today. <laughs> yeah, it was a fun one. So I have another longer form question, which is going to help us kind of wrap up. What advice would you give, you know, you and Dr. Nicole, you work with a lot of pretty influential leaders and have had a lot of success in breaking down their limits, their ceiling, so that they can they can expand, they can create more global change. And I'm curious as to, you know, if there <clears throat> there is any of the influential leaders out there listening and they're in pursuit of generational change, but they're feeling a ceiling, whether it's in their wealth or health or family, you know, global change, what advice would you give them to start in breaking down whatever ceiling is, is above them? I mean, it doesn't matter where you're at. We all have ceilings. Anybody that says that they don't have a ceiling, they're going in the re- reverse direction in life. And because if you can't acknowledge a ceiling, then you think you're at the top and understanding the flow of energy and the fractal aspect of it, there is no top. There's always a higher and there's always a lower, which is interesting, but not really the answer to your question. Where would you start the, this is honestly different for everybody coming from a human behavior standpoint of view. You want to start with what somebody's going to be most inspired by is the probably the the best answer because that's where somebody's going to make the most amount of change. That's where somebody's going to experience the most amount of love. That's where somebody's going to experience the most amount of growth. So being able to always be in alignment with inspiring somebody when somebody's inspired the body, the mind and the spirit is all connected, all in alignment. And they're all using that you're in that most empowered, powerful state one can be in. So you're going to have the biggest amount of change, productivity, et cetera. On the other aspect, this is more like the mental looking at it is that you want to be able to evaluate all different aspects of somebody's life, be able to look at what's kind of like the lowest, what's holding somebody back, like the breaks I was talking about and Mm -hmm. bring that up because that's, what's going to allow their life to kind of like roll easiest. If you connect everything like a wagon wheel back in the day, that's what I used this analogy now, like people like what the fuck is a wagon? (laughs) No, that's a good analogy. So if they, if, if they were to work with you and Dr. Nicole, where would you start with them? I guess, like you said, it depends on, well, we do both. I mean, we do this whole process of an evaluation that we're, we're getting all that data and through the process, we're also like, we're because every human being's wired differently. Some of them are going to connect better and say like, you know, this is, this is a huge, like, I'm just like, you got a hole in the ship. Like this, we got to patch this first instead of like trying to put, you know, more fuel to go faster or a better engine. Like doesn't matter if that part of that ship is sinking, you're going to be slowed down. So every, every case is different, but you know, our process as we go through is we, we evaluate all these different things to figure out what's going to best serve that individual in that moment. And then from there, it's just constantly, you know, going, going through and up leveling. The easiest way I, I put it at it is that we're all going back to this fake word energy and energy is just a battery. So we're just a battery. We can't give what we don't have. So if we want to make a bigger amount of change within the world, we have to have a bigger amount of energy to make that change. So we always have to be able to make sure that our tank is full of energy, that we're not wasting any energy, that we're utilizing and directing that energy very specifically, very intently with the biggest amount of returns on that investment of energy. But then we need to grow the container to be able to harness more energy so that we continue to give more. And what we give equally comes back to us and we receive. Hence the container being the integrative medicine work on the body and the psychoenergetic work, working on that energy and where it's purposely placed. That's amazing. Dr. Nick, thank you so much for 
answering my one words. And then also uh, I went a little off script asking some questions, but I have so many more. And so we're going to have to have a a 2.0 of this. No, this is fun. (laughs) Thank you. Okay, everyone. We'll see you next time.